before I read the gospel, it, it's always uh, been kind of neat to, uh, to read that particular scripture in Genesis, because when, when God, <coughs> you know, almost tongue-in-cheek, uh, has Adam fall asleep and takes his rib, and then after creating the woman, he presents the, uh, the woman to Adam, and he goes, now here's one I can relate to. I just love that, you know, as God loves us and provides for our every need. Boy, you know, he, I'm sure that Adam said, boy, howdy, no. <laughs> and then uh, looking at the second lesson, you know, and, and uh, seeing how the writer of Hebrews is describing uh, Jesus and in his in his fullness and yet in his lowliness and and being able to uh, to see what what God was up to in presenting Jesus to us as as the bride, uh, wow! Uh, and the, well, not only the bride but the bridegroom and the, and the high priest and all those in the sacrificial lamp. It's just marvelous uh, the description that that the writer of Hebrews gives. And then talking about uh, what the gospel is the reading is about. And I'll explain a little bit more about that after the reading. So the Holy Gospel is recorded in the 10th chapter of Mark. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they, meaning uh, the people, were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him And say that we love him Open our ears, Lord And help us to listen Open our eyes, Lord We want to see Jesus Dear friends and family in Christ, may God's grace and his mercy be yours. From the one who is, who was, and who is to come, our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Jesus addresses for what us and folks back then would consider a very hot topic. There are several of those kinds of things in Scripture and there are an awful lot of preachers who would just as soon not even touch them. Uh -huh. There's a good reason for that sometimes. But I want to address this. It's important. Uh, Jesus is a, a compassionate Lord and Savior. And let me share some things. With, first of all, with a question. Has anyone here not had a hardness of heart? Hmm. I don't see any hands going up here. That must mean that we've all experienced something like that, maybe just recently or in our past. Maybe we're struggling with it. What does hardness of heart mean? Well, let's take a gander at that. 
defying authority, refuse to forgive, refuse to listen, refuse to obey? How about refusing to turn one's life away from destructive behavior? Hardness of heart makes us treat others like dirt, treating others as if they were our possessions. Jesus addressed something very crucial, critical in his day. The Pharisees were trying to entrap him, as they were prone to do. <laughs> Good old Pharisees. You know, their minds were in the right place, but their hearts were a long ways away. Why was that? It's because they became so legalistic. They wanted to keep God's Torah law so strictly that after a while, they themselves didn't even know what was right or wrong. They just made more rules and regulations. They expounded from the Ten Commandments, the original ones, and by, by the time they were finished with, with it, there was over 600 additional laws. And Torah law then became so expanded, and the Pharisees and others who taught the law expected that it would be kept perfectly. In fact, one of, the, uh, one of the thoughts or beliefs back then was that if everyone in Israel could keep the law perfectly for one day, Messiah would come. How's that been working out for them? Jesus, in addressing this issue about divorce, he has some things that I think often we don't think about. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, then it shall be if, he find no if she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some unseemly thing in her, that he shall write her a bill of divorce and give it in her hand and send her out of the house. When she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. If the latter husband hate her and write her a bill, and write her a bill of divorce from him and give it to her in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, who took her to be his wife, her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she's defiled, for that is an abomination before Yahweh, God. And you shall not cause the land to sin, which Yahweh your God gives you for an inheritance. What? <laughs> you know what that meant? It meant that in those days, a woman had no rights. They were a possession of the man. And as a possession of the man, he could do whatever he wanted to do. So, for an example, if he saw some other sweet young thing walking along, oh, I'd like to have her as my wife, he could just simply go home, write out a certificate of divorce, hand it to his wife, she was on the street just like that. Or, he got up one morning and she had burned his breakfast. Write out a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, She's out. Even if he just all of a sudden says, I'm tired of you, he could write her a divorce certificate and she was gone. That sounds really harsh. How would we be doing under something like that? I want you to look at, at, listen to one thing and that notice that this passage out of Deuteronomy does not grant a man permission permission to divorce his wife, but simply describes without condemnation a situation where the man has already decided to do it. Did you hear that? Let me repeat it. It does not grant a man permission to divorce his wife, but simply describes without condemnation a situation where a man has already done so. In other words, in his heart, he's already plan to get rid of her. So what, the, what this law does is it, it covers what a man has already decided to do. Now let me go a little further so that if, if you're confused along with me at this point, <laughs> it might be helpful to hear a little more. The emphasis the emphasis is not on granting the husband permission to divorce, but rather on permit, per, 
prohibiting him from remarrying an ex-wife who has married another man. This certificate of divorce provides the divorced wife with legal protection and to the right to remarry. Now, if it had just been a certificate of divorce and she's out on the street, that would be one thing. But what the divorce certificate gave her was the right to be able to be married again. If it was left to what the man wanted, she'd just be gone. She'd have to either go back to live with her parents or she'd have to live on the streets. And usually what a woman would have to do is turn to prostitution in order to support herself. Which would, in many cases, happen, but that was a tragedy. So this law provided the woman with some rights. Something that she was able to do to make a bad situation less bad. And you notice that this decree shows no condemnation. Did you notice that? No condemnation on behalf of the woman. Je Jesus is uh, being entrapped, and Jesus knew it. So he asks them, what does the law say? And so they give him the answer. But you see, Jesus said it was for your hardness of heart that Moses gave you the permission to do this. Hardness of heart is already making decisions about things and sticking to it regardless of how false and foolish it is. So it was one way that Moses was able to help people cope with something that was already present. Divorce didn't start right after the, uh, the Torah law was given. It was already happening. But God was merciful and loving so that he would give them guidance as to how to handle those bad situations. He wasn't condemning them. He's saying, this is happening, so let's try to get this figured out so folks are not wandering around Wandering around, not wandering around, but wandering around, wander, wondering what's next. Is there another shoe that's going to drop? <sighs> the Torah law permits something that doesn't mean that God approves of it. Divorce is simply the lesser of two evils, an escape hatch here to reduce the destructive effects of a hard heart. In some cases, annulment, we've, we have our brothers and sisters in Christ that exercise that. It might differ from divorce in a technical sense, but it too uh, is made necessary by hardness of heart. Things that have already been decided. But Jesus never declares Deuteronomy invalid. Not once. For he says... From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He established what God's order was and continues to be. And then he moves this discussion from Deuteronomy to Genesis. Notice he goes back to the beginning to help people understand. And then from Moses back to God, from divorce to marriage, from that which is permitted only in which it is intended he does not contest that Deuteronomy chapter 24 permits divorce, but says that Moses made the allowance as a concession to our hardness of heart. Our sinful nature is the hardness of heart that we're talking about here. Nobody gets away from it. Everybody has this hardness of heart. It's the sinful nature that comes from the fall. When Adam and Eve turned their back on God and says, we'll do it our way, thank you very much, and then had to suffer the consequences. That is its root. It's hardness of heart. So Jesus doesn't argue with Moses. What good would that be? He instead moves to an even more profound authority. He goes back to the authority of the scriptures, and he cites Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 in there to establish God's original intent that the man and the woman become one flesh. 
that they are married and that they live together as helpers, help meets for one another. And then he says, what therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. You've probably heard it said that uh, what the example Jesus is using here is like a yoke of oxen, where they are yoked together, they are to work together in harmony. And we all know what happens if one of the oxen is sloughing off. The other one has to work even harder. And after a while, one is completely tired out, and the other one's just still kind of dragging its feet. And so you have disharmony, and no longer can they pull the weight together, weight that comes from the challenges and all the changes that happen in the world through society, things that are encroaching upon our lives, trying us to separate, trying us to get to do the wrong thing, and that is not to work together, not to honor each other, not to respect each other, and above all, not to love each other, even when some days you don't even like the other person. Ever had a day like that? I'm sure Cheryl has. <laughs> You're not going to say anything. Okay. Let that be a good thing. Uh, so it is with people. If there's one person in the, in the union that is carrying a grudge, it affects the performance of the marriage, of the relationship. If one suffers then, if one is having a problem, they both have a problem. That's just how it is. Now, after, after that, Jesus is in the house, and his disciples are asking him about it again. And uh, he goes into some language that really sounds kind of weird. Uh, he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Now, this is a very dramatic statement, especially in a patriarchal culture that does not get this, does not acknowledge adultery as, a, as an offense against the woman. It's an offense against the woman's father. Remember, marriages were arranged. There were dowries paid. There were uh, agreements made. And if the man divorces the woman, that's an affront to the father who says, oh, my daughter's no longer any good for you? What does that mean? Did you get the little Jewish thing? <laughs> I think that kind of went. <laughs> Besides that. Jesus goes on to say, if a woman div herself divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Scholars will say that Jewish women were not free to divorce their husbands, so that, that verse 12 must reflect something of the culture. And if you remember, these were folks within a Roman culture, and that, as this uh, gospel was written. And as we know, the culture always tends to influence people, no matter uh, what quote-unquote religion they are in. Case in point, our own culture nowadays. The societal craziness that we have. The foolishness, the confusion of sexes, not people saying, I don't know what I am. Today I, I identify as a woman, today as a man, today as I don't know. It's crazy. It's not germane to today. It happened back then in that first century, the second century, and on up. And we find that it raises its ugly head constantly. But the Roman culture at the time that was written, uh, divorce was rampant. And whereas scholars would say that wouldn't happen with, with the Jews, no. If you remember, Herodias divorced her husband Herod and married his brother Philip. Remember that uh, you know, John the Baptist got involved and he lost his head over it. He condemned the behavior, and Herodias hated him and found an opportunity to get rid of John. 
because John was making him responsible and making her responsible. The Mishnah, which is a commentary within the Torah law, grants women the right to divorce their husbands under certain exceptional circumstances, such as impotence. They had a right to do that. Because the whole point, when God gave the directions for the man and the woman, he says, be fruitful and multiply. Well, if you can't multiply, you can't fulfill God's commands. So, find somebody who can help you do that. Interesting. But in Matthew chapter 5 and in ver and chapter 19, Jesus is making an exception for the person who divorces an unchaste spouse. And that was the, uh, the bottom line. That was the only reason at that time that uh, the Jews and now the Christians were allowed to divorce. It didn't mean that there couldn't be reconciliation and the marriage remain intact. It simply meant that if there was unchastity, unfaithfulness, they were allowed to do that. Then it goes on to talk about, with, with Paul and making commentary as to what Jesus was teaching in, in his day, his advice to believers who are married to unbelievers. Here's where it gets interesting. The believer should continue in the marriage if the unbelieving partner is willing. But if the unbelieving partner separates, he says, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound. If there's any question about the meaning of the word bound, Paul clarifies it later in the chapter. He says, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if the husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but only in the Lord. So is Jesus condemning all who divorce and remarry? Well, verses 11 through 12 certainly give that impression, but it's interesting to compare these verses with the, you have heard it said, as Jesus says many times, like in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' words here are equally strict with regard to anger, or adultery, or divorce, or oaths, or retaliation, or, well, enemies. Taking just the first of these as an example, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the ancient ones, You shall not murder, and whoever shall murder shall be in danger of the judgment. But I tell you, here's Jesus' authority coming out. Whoever shall murder shall be in danger. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Racha! shall be in danger of the council, and whoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of the fire of Gehenna, in other words, of hell. Now that word racha means you empty-headed fool. In other words, you brainless, and all those other things that kind of go along with it. Many of us have had a Christian brother or sister to whom we are not reconciled. Does that mean that we're utterly condemned if we don't reconcile? And what about the equality, high, equal, equally, boy, I'm telling you, equally high standards with regard to adultery, such as lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, enemies. Is Jesus establishing a new and even more impossible law to replace the already impossible Mosaic law? Well, rather than establishing even higher standards, Jesus is calling us to a purposely and greater, higher vision. He wants us to conduct ourselves in keeping with God's will so that we might be a blessing to our families, our neighbors, ourselves. When we fail to keep his perfect standards perfectly, our failure, failures boy, remind us that our only hope is in and always, Jesus. Always. The cross. The open tomb. Forgiveness. If this is true for angry adultery, uh, oaths, retaliation, enemies, it must also be true for divorce. 
As Jesus later says in this chapter in response to his disciples' question, who then can be saved if this is the way it is? And Jesus says, remember, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That's good news. It's good news. Because we're always tempted to view Jesus' words about divorce through a legalistic lens. As if Jesus divided the world into three camps, the first one being those who, uh, whose original marriages are intact and those who are free from sin, and second, those who are divorced and who have thus failed to meet God's expectations, and third, those who are divorced and remarried and who are thus living in a state of perpetual adultery. However, an intact marriage proves neither that the marriage partners are sinless nor that they are less sinful than a couple that has divorced. Is an intact but abusive marriage any less sinful than a broken marriage? We hear from Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So our only one hope, single, married or divorced, is the grace of God. The grace of God. We need to guard against adopting uh, the same legalist, legalistic framework as the Pharisees who are trying to entrap Jesus. A framework that Jesus repeatedly refused to accept. In verses 6 through 9, Jesus moves the discussion away from legal considerations and toward a vision of God's intention. Verses 11 through 12 appear legalistic. But Jesus neither issues edicts against divorce nor pronounces woes on those who divorce and remarry. He doesn't do it. For you see, many divorced people have had little or no choice in their divorces. The notion that there is no innocent party in a divorce is highly questionable. Some people marry the wrong person, such as someone who is, might be a philanderer or an abuser, an addict, or whatever it's all downhill from there. So we must be careful not to treat the consequences of their initial poor choice as the unforgivable sin. The hardness of heart that Moses wrote this for the certificate of divorce was not to close the door absolutely on divorce. It simply curbs some of the worst abuses and it was still a fact in Jesus' life in his day and is a fact of life today. As divorce is swept scythe-like through our own society, the church has been guilty of three errors. One, one has been to adopt a legalistic stance that offers no grace to a divorced person. Second, to buy into too easily the popular culture, to fail to call people to faithfulness to God's intent, which is married to one spouse until death do us part. The third is to fail to emphasize to young people that it's important for Christians to marry Christians. That idea fails the test of political correctness, but has solid Old Testament roots. And I could give you a whole bunch of references, but I won't. But the New Testament teaches that uh, marriage between Christians will not guarantee a good marriage, but it will give the couple a common faith, a common vision, and a common Lord. As someone has said, the family that prays together stays together. Well, it's maybe not true in every case, but it's been shown statistically that couples who worship together, who pray together, are more likely to stay together than those who don't. My friend Dick Lefevre does a lot of uh, marriage counseling, and he's married quite a few, and uh, with many of them, as is uh, so much today, that they're cohabitating before marriage. And so he gives them a statistic <laughs> that says, did you know that if you live together before marriage, your marriage is 80% more likely to fail. And their eyes get big. And he says, but I have some good news for you. 
If you go to worship together, and you pray together, your chances improve by 60%. That's good news. What does that tell us? Divorce may be there, but there's hope for all marriages and even those who are divorced. It means that God is still gracious, he's merciful, and his, his arms are held out wide open for each and every one of us to, well, come clean with God. And saying, you know, it's not what I wanted, it's not what I expected, and yes, for some, it was a hardness of heart, I just got tired, I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And Jesus is, is telling us, there is grace for you. Don't get despondent. Know that these things happen. But know that I'm there for you. Know that I will bring healing to you. Know that I can change your heart. Know that I can help you get past some of the, the hardness, the, the, the feelings of failure. Our son uh, was divorced from his first wife after nine years, almost ten years. It's one of those cases, and I think some of you can relate to, is that we tried our best to talk him out of it. Because we could see that she was not a good thing for him. But you know what they say, we're in love. That, that will make us successful, we're in love. Well, it's not always the case. We thought that his, uh, his first wife was a Christian, but it ended up that she was not. She had gotten into Wiccan. White witchcraft, as if there's any white witch. And she would not let it go. So, after about nine, almost ten years, uh, he said he'd had enough. And couldn't do it anymore. He struggled terribly with the feelings that he had failed. That he had failed himself, he'd failed uh, everybody, the families, but he'd failed God. We had to share with him some of the realities that, you know, in, in a lot of cases, if you're unequally yoked, as they say, uh, you're fighting an uphill battle, and more than likely, a losing battle. It's a tragedy. Yet at the same time, what was the lesser of two evils? To remain in a relationship where there was incompatibility with, well, putting religion aside, with faith. Being a Christian and a non-Christian, a pagan, and adamantly a pagan, unequally yoked. God's grace was there for our son. God's grace was there for, for, uh, for Meg. And we have prayed for her. And we hope that one day, she will turn, and she will become a Christian. That's up to God. We focus on the one, our own son, who was devastated, but by the way, now is remarried to a wonderful Christian woman. The very first thing that, that helped them in hitting it off is that, well, he wasn't looking for a relationship. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way God works. He says, gotcha. Anyway, he met... Uh, he met his wife, Sharon, and uh, they were at a bowling tournament. I know I'm going on a little too long, but folks, this is really important to share with you. And they got to talking. And she thought, since he was in, lived in Utah and he was so clean cut that he was a Mormon. And she did not want to marry a Mormon. Uh, so she asked her brother, who was on the same bowling team, is, is Paul a Mormon? He says, you don't ask people that. She says, I do. So she went up and point blank to ask him, Paul, are you a Mormon? And he says, no, I'm a Christian. She went, praise the Lord. <laughs> so uh, they talked almost all night. And she lived in California. And as they were saying goodbye to each other, she said, Paul, can we pray together? And he said, well, yeah. And they did. 
and they began this relationship, he in Utah, she in California. Every so often they would be able to uh, accumulate enough money that one of the two would fly either way. She would stay with her brother who lived in Utah, and then when he went down there, he stayed, who would he stay with? I, I can't remember, it was some relative out there. Uh, so they remained chaste in the relationship. And one thing led to another, and well, now they've been married for five years, right? Almost six, coming on. And it's uh, probably one of the most beautiful things we've ever seen. Have we condemned our son for divorce? No. Uh, we have thanked God that he found someone who he could be equally yoked with. And pray for, for Meg, wherever she is and whatever she's doing, that one day she might find uh, the graces of God once again and come back. So there is always hope and there's blessings and there's no condemnation as far as God is concerned. He doesn't like it. But those things happen, and he wants each and every one of us to know that he walks beside us in those times of pain. And finally, as we move from that point on into Jesus blessing the children, we see what, what the kingdom of God is all about. It's embracing us as his little children. It's knowing that we make mistakes, we try to do things our way, we try to walk away from God. We, we just absolutely, stubbornly want to do it the way we want to do it. And God doesn't give up <laughs> because he loves us. He cherishes us. And he says, come on, get yoked up with me and let's, let's see what life can be like. Let's see what, what beauty can be when you are with me and in my presence. Let's see how things can get turned around from you, for you and experience a love beyond comparison, not, not just a, a love of a new spouse or your first spouse, but the love of God that can make all things so wonderful. Now, if you yourself is, is experiencing something now, know that our Lord Jesus loves you and he wants to walk with you. Let him do it. Uh, if you know someone who is going through a divorce, Give them your encouragement. Help them realize that Jesus walks with them. Help them realize that this is not a con God is not condemning them, nor is he going to send you to hell uh, for going through a divorce or being divorced. He's going to bring healing to you. And it doesn't mean that things are going to be all hunky-dory and better. It just means that you will, ha will know that when you trust and obey God for guidance, he's going to be there. And he's going to love you, despite all the crazy things that you might do. Because he's a God of grace and love. So let him love you. Huh? Let, him, let him take you in his, in his arms. And like children who trust in him, and children who trust their, their folks for giving them all things good. And yes, we, we get upset with them. Uh, we want to sometimes smash them, but we never stop loving them. And that's how it is with God in us. So even if it's some other heinous sin, quote, in quote, other than divorce or along with it, know that there is forgiveness and there is grace. And you can take that one all the way to heaven with you. Hmm? Amen.